Greetings and welcome on behalf of the Lumen Christie Institute. My name is Michael Le Chevalier and I serve as Associate Director here. Lumen Christie was founded in 1997 by Catholic scholars at the University of Chicago. And our mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition a living dialogue partner at the university, within the broader academy, and within our wider society. We do this through LEP courses, lectures, summer seminars, and now virtual events. Today's event is part of an ongoing series at Lumen Christi that sets economics in dialogue with Catholic social thought and the broader Catholic tradition. This is the second of a two-part special focus on Catholic education that draws together experts, industry leaders, and practitioners to consider the integral development of students in Catholic schools in the US and now globally. If you missed our first event that looked at Catholic education in the US, you can revisit it and recordings for all of our events on our YouTube channel. A link will be posted in the chat for this. We have a series of up upcoming events that I'd like to call to your attention. On March 20th, we will host Catholic philosopher Charles Taylor and political scientists Patricia Nance, Madeline Taylor, and Jason Blakey, Blakely for a discussion entitled Fragile Democracy, Technocratic Takeover, and Popular Renewal. You can register for this with the link that will be posted within the chat. This series on economics and Catholic social thought continues on April 29th with an event on automation and the future of work. Today's event wouldn't be, made, uh, wouldn't be possible without a number of organizers and co-sponsors. This event is organized with the Catholic Research Economist Discussion Organization, the Global Catholic Education, Global Researchers Advancing Universities, um, Advancing Catholic Education or GRACE, the International Federation of Catholic Universities, IFCU, the National Catholic Education Association, the NCEA, and the International Office of Catholic Education. This event is co-sponsored by American Media and the Roche Center for Catholic Education. I'm grateful for these many institutions that helped ensure the success of today's event. You too can help support the programs like these. First, you can join our email list and share news of this or future events with others. Even in a global age, word of mouth remains the most effective form of communication for this type of work. You can become a financial supporter as well of our efforts to put on programs like this for free by donating today at www.lumenchristi.org donate. At the end of the presentations, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. You can post a question, however, at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. I now have the pleasure of welcoming Philippe Richard, Secretary General of International Association of Catholic Education based out of Rome to offer a word of welcome and to introduce our speakers. Philippe, would you now unmute yourself and turn on your video? Thank you so much, Mikhail. Dear friends, good afternoon or good morning or good evening to each of you from uh, around the world. We well, have joined this webinar presenting the Global Report on Catholic Education 2021. First of all, uh, I would like to warmly thank Lumen Christi Institute for ensuring the logistics uh, of this webinar and more particularly Mikhail and Mark. And then thank each of the speakers present today, Cantine Wooden, Francois Mabille, Augusta Mutigeni, and uh, Asley Rogers. Uh, we will have the opportunity to present them better later. Of course, <clears throat> I would like on behalf of the OIAC and uh, FACU to address a very special thank you to Cantine Wooden for the magnificent work he has done for the drafting of this 2021 report. May I receive the expression of any, the gratitude of the large community of actors in Catholic education around the world for the precious help it brings us. The global report on Catholic education represents a major event in the life of our organizations. Indeed, we have very little detailed information of an academic nature to understand the work carried out by the large educational network in the world. 
uh, that of Catholic schools on the one hand and that of over and uh, Catholic university. Writing this uh, annual report allows us to make this network better, this better now uh, within the international organization in which we are represented. It allows us to better demonstrate the concern we have to engage with the international community for the realization of the right to education and beyond for the objectives of world development, which have been promulgated by United Nations system. It's also the representation of a network able to engage with Pope Francis with the global compact on education. In fact, given the nature of our commitments and our relationship with the church, the work we do can only be measured against strictly economic criteria. Within our organizations, we seek to promote quality education, a culture of dialogue and the concern to render the service of education for the poorest, those who find themselves in what Pope Francis calls peripheries. We know that the global pandemic crisis has increased inequalities in education. This report therefore sheds light on education for poverty and education for pluralism in the particular context of COVID-19. This report will help us to make further progress towards the objectives set by the Global Compact on Education. Four speakers will speak successively in this webinar. First, Kantin Wooden. Kantin Wooden, author of the report, is a lead economist with the World Bank's Education Global Practice and a project manager, pro bono, with the International Office of Catholic Education. Second, Francois Mabille is a secretary general of the International Federation of Catholic Universities. Third, uh, Augusta Boutigani is national executive secretary of the Commission for Education and Religious Education, Kenya, Conference of Catholic Bishop. She is also the former president of OIEC. And uh, last, Elze Rogers is a lead economist with the World Bank's Education Global Practice and served as co-director of the World Development Report uh, 2018, Learning to Realize Education's Promise. We are very honored to have you here and we give you the floor without delay, specifying that we will soon organize a presentation of this report in Spanish and in French. Please continue, you, you have the floor. Thank you, Philippe, and, and thank you, Michael. Um, so as Philippe uh, mentioned it, uh, I'm going to make a presentation of the draft uh, report for about 25 minutes, and then we will have um, a panel uh, with uh, Hassi, Augusta, and Francois. So let me share my screen. And I hope that you can all uh, see it. Here it is. Um, so, uh, this is the second uh, Global Catholic Education Report. Um, we actually did the first one uh, about eight months ago, um, and we plan to do one every year. The theme of this report um, is education pluralism, learning poverty, and the right to education. I do want to emphasize this is a draft report. Um, I posted it yesterday night on the Global Catholic Education website, and we will welcome comments from any of you. Uh, until March 9, uh, we will try to integrate those comments and then we will finalize the report. Uh, many of you know that Catholic schools and uh, universities serve um, a lot of students, 62 million students in uh, preschool, primary and secondary education uh, and 6.5 million um, at the university level. Um, we had, as Michael mentioned it, a first webinar uh, about a month ago um, on uh, research specifically for the US. And this webinar um, is meant for presenting some findings related uh, to the global footprint of um, Catholic schools and universities. Um, uh, OIEC uh, and if you are co-sponsoring the report, I just want to mention also OMAEC and UMEC. Uh, OMAEC is the Association of the Alumni of Catholic Education and UMEC is the Association of the Teachers 
in Catholic schools and universities, and all four, OIEC, IFQ, OMAIC, and UMEC, are the core partners of this new website um, at globalcatholiceducation.org that we launched a few months ago. Um, before I launch into the report, um, I want to mention that one of the missions uh, of the Global Catholic Education website and project is to promote research on Catholic education. Uh, I would assume that some of you are researchers, uh, some of you are practitioners. Um, we have a number of special issues coming up. Um, uh, one on the learning crisis, problems and solutions, and this is one of the themes of the report today that we will share. Um, another one on Catholic and faith-based schools in Africa, and a third one on Catholic education and the concept of pluralism, and especially how pluralism can be lived in practice uh, within Catholic um, schools or universities. Uh, these are special issues of journals, and we also welcome contributions to the Educacio Seed Bulletin, which we publish every quarter, and finally, to the Global Catholic Education Knowledge Note series. Uh, we want to use the platform of the new website that was created a few months ago um, as a way to share uh, research. And so go to the calls for papers page and you can find that information. So today, uh, the idea uh, is to share some key findings from the Global Catholic Education Report. Um, I'm going to uh, go essentially uh, through the structure of the report. Uh, which has five chapters. Uh, the first one is about trends in enrollment um, in Catholic schools. Uh, we already had that actually um, in the report of last year, uh, but because this year we introduced also in the report a discussion of higher education, I'm going to go through it again. And probably most of you have not seen uh, those basic data. So the first two chapters are about simply um, the trends in enrollment, um, but there are some important findings there. Uh, then we will talk about education pluralism, um, and I'm going to introduce a measure uh, for education pluralism, and some of you might tell me this is not a good measure, then we'll change it. This is a draft report, so we welcome um, suggestions. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how taking into account pluralism seriously, uh, or the need for pluralism, um, could make an impact on how we measure uh, the fulfillment of the right to education. And then finally, uh, the last chapter of the report um, is about the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the challenges and opportunities. This was already discussed in the 2020 report, but we have a number of new data uh, and, and new advice uh, that we can share for how Catholic schools and universities can cope uh, with that crisis. So uh, let me go uh, then into the, the basic data. Um, uh, and first, uh, the trends in enrollment in uh, Catholic schools, uh, K-12, that's an acronym for the United States, means kindergarten, preschool, to the 12th grade, so the completion of secondary education. Uh, you can see that over time in this graph, um, there has been growth in enrollment, and uh, today uh, almost 62 million children are enrolled in Catholic uh, schools uh, around the world. Uh, what is particularly important is the blue bar at the bottom, and this represents Africa, both Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa, and you can see that a quite a bit, um, a large share, if you will, of the total growth in enrollment uh, is really happening uh, in Africa, uh, which I think has implications even for those of us who are not located uh, in Africa, but might work in, in a Catholic university, for example, uh, in the US or in Europe, uh, I think we, we have to do more uh, to help uh, Catholic education specifically in Africa. This slide shows uh, the same trend over time for Catholic higher education. So that includes universities, but it also includes um, uh, what the Catholic Church calls higher institutes, which are post-secondary um, education, uh, but not uh, within a university. Um, while uh, Catholic enrollment um, or enrollment in Catholic schools about doubled uh, since 1975 to 2018, it quadrupled um, for universities. So the growth is even, is even larger. But what you can see, and look again at the little blue uh, section at the bottom uh, of the graph, uh, that is not yet in Africa. It will happen someday in Africa. But still, uh, most of the uh, students enrolled in Catholic education at the higher level uh, are um, in the Americas, um, uh, specifically in Latin America and the US 
for, for the largest part. So the trend is also uh, a high level of growth that is expected to continue, um, uh, but uh, with a very different um, geography, if you will, of where uh, the students currently enrolled um, do live. Now, these um, uh, three pie charts are just to re-emphasize again um, the fact that um, the geography of Catholic education is very different depending on the level at which you look at, right? Uh, instead of looking here uh, by region, uh, the idea is to look by income groups. Uh, and the World Bank has a classification of income groups with four categories. You have low income countries, then you have lower middle income countries, upper middle income countries, and high income countries. What is stunning is that 41%, uh, uh, that's the pie chart on the left, 41% of the students who are in Catholic schools uh, at the primary level today live in low income countries. Um, by contrast, uh, only 17% um, of uh, the students at the secondary school level are in low income countries. And of course, uh, for uh, the last pie chart, uh, it's less than 3%. Um, of the students uh, in Catholic universities that are in um, uh, low-income countries. Now, um, I work in development, uh, and I should have said that at the beginning, sorry, let me say it now. Anything that I say today is not representing in any way uh, what my employer, uh, the World Bank, uh, might think. Uh, this is volunteer work at a personal level, so I represent only personally myself. Um, so, uh, but, but, but for international development organizations, the fact that especially at the primary and lower secondary level, um, Catholic schools are really having uh, many students um, uh, matters uh, for, for policy and we'll come back to that at the end. Now, the third chapter um, is about education pluralism. And this report is a little bit more technical uh, than the first report we did uh, a little bit less than a year ago. Uh, because one of the ideas was to introduce a measure of education pluralism. Um, now, uh, education pluralism means many different things to many different people. Uh, and arguments for or against uh, pluralism uh, can be made from, from very different points of view. Um, the argument that is made in this report, that's not the sole argument, but it is to say that um, there are differences in priorities um, among parents about what children should learn in school. Um, and in the seminar about a month ago in the US, uh, I shared, for example, data uh, on differences in priorities among parents with a child in Catholic schools versus parents with uh, children in other schools. And uh, parents in, in, with children in Catholic schools place a much higher emphasis on values and the lower, to a lower extent on faith than is the case for the population uh, as a whole. Now, um, I, do, I do believe that we need to respect um, those parental priorities, and this is actually defined uh, as such in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which has actually three uh, provisions, not one, and the third one is that parents have a right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. Now, to try to measure pluralism, uh, you can look at the conditions for pluralism. I mean, do the laws and regulatory framework allow, for example, Catholic, other faith-based, other private uh, schools to operate, right? Uh, is there funding uh, from the state uh, that differs a lot between uh, different states and so on? The idea here uh, is to actually look at the outcome, uh, which is the enrollment in uh, different types um, of schools. And uh, in the literature on market concentration, industrial concentration, uh, you have what is called the herfindahl hirschman index, HHI, is defined as the sum of the market shares of different providers squared. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but based on that, you can define something which is a bit the reverse, which is a normalized education pluralism index, which is a function of the um, HHI. Essentially, uh, it's based on the market shares uh, of the different providers, uh, and it takes a value uh, that increases when you have more equality among market shares. Um, now, there are lots of technical issues that are discussed in the report. Um, uh, I should probably increase more of, of that discussion with the caveats of that measure, but that's the measure that is used. And I'm sorry to have spent a bit too much time to try to explain it. Now, um, this is uh, the data um, on the market share, right? The, the measure of education pluralism looks at whether uh, students are enrolled in different types of schools. Um, it's actually measured globally and for each country only with three types of providers, uh, public providers, uh, private non-Catholic and private Catholic. 
Um, and the reason why that is done only with three types of providers is because there is no data globally or for all countries on the footprint of other types of providers. It could be Protestant schools, could be Islamic schools, could be some specific types of private schools that is not available. But still with three types of providers, you already have some useful information. And, and this graph simply shows the market share of Catholic schools, which is especially high at the primary level in sub-Saharan Africa and in low-income countries. In low-income countries, one in seven children is actually enrolled in a Catholic school. Some of them are public schools, actually quite a few are public schools, and some others are uh, considered as private schools. So um, these are the measures of education pluralism. Uh, so a few things um, very quickly. Um, you can see that uh, first education pluralism uh, is higher, uh, the way it is measured in this report, uh, for the higher levels of education. So it's lower for primary than a bit higher for secondary than a bit higher for tertiary. And, and that makes intuitive sense because the state has especially a responsibility to provide primary and secondary education. And, th and there's more diversity in choices at, at the higher level you go, especially in higher education. Th th there are large differences uh, between different regions and between different income groups. I won't go through them um, in terms of that measure of education pluralism. Uh, for example, in North America, um, you don't have a lot of pluralism at the primary and secondary level, but you have a lot of pluralism at the higher education level. Now, uh, you can actually compute uh, in, in a very simple way the contribution uh, to that measure of pluralism um, uh, by Catholic schools uh, and Catholic universities simply by comparing what the measure is with only two providers, public versus private, and then three providers, public, private, or Catholic, and private, Catholic. And you see that um, Catholic schools actually contribute to pluralism, especially, uh, again, in uh, low-income countries and in sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, the, the point of view taken in the report is that pluralism is in principle a good thing. I mean, we could discuss how to measure it. This is just a first try, uh, and we really welcome your comments as to whether uh, this is a good measure or we should adapt it, change it, I don't know. Um, this is a draft report, so we have time to, to make improvements. Uh, based on uh, pluralism, then we look at uh, a measure of the fulfillment of the right to education. Again, this is a little bit technical. Um, the, the, the right to education um, at the primary level, so the right to education primary index or the right to education secondary index or the right to education tertiary index uh, is defined as um, a function of two variables. The first one is an education outcome. Um, and uh, the second one is that little expression there, uh, which takes uh, pluralism into account. But we're not saying that you need to have equal market shares among everybody, which is what would give you the highest measure for the um, uh, normalized education pluralism index. Uh, you could have a certain level uh, of pluralism, uh, call it Z, that is enough. Uh, and then there is no benefit of more pluralism than that. What Z is remains to be discussed. Um, but that uh, formula, if you will, takes that into account. We are not at all saying that uh, you should have the maximum uh, level of pluralism with everybody having an equal market share. That does not make sense. You would not expect, for example, um, uh, Catholic schools to have um, many, many, many more students, even though they have many students who are not Catholic, but many more than, than the market share of, of, of Catholicism, for example, if we can call it that way. Uh, now, the education outcome uh, that we need to take into account, that, that, that's very important. And the World Bank came uh, up recently uh, with a measure of learning poverty, um, which um, I think, and many other people think, uh, that this is a better measure than simply a completion rate uh, for primary education or certainly not an enrollment rate. Uh, the issue is that you can have children who are completing primary education and who may actually not be able to read and understand an age appropriate text uh, very well, right? Um, so. Uh, learning poverty is measured <clears throat> as the share of the children who are 10 year old, uh, who are actually able to understand uh, and read, of course, to understand an age appropriate text. Um, and I think that uh, one of our uh, panelists, um, Halsey, will, will talk a bit more about that measure. Um, it uh, is used uh, at the primary level as a better measure of the outcomes uh, that you have. But then uh, by introducing also a certain weight uh, for education pluralism, which as I mentioned, is actually specifically part 
um, of how the right to education is defined in the uh, human rights uh, declaration, um, we then uh, add another dimension, right? And um, if you don't have any pluralism, then the right to education uh, primary index will be lower than uh, simply uh, one minus learning poverty, right? For secondary and tertiary, we don't have an equivalent to learning poverty. And so the suggestion is to use the lower secondary completion rate because the upper is not available and then the gross tertiary enrollment rate, but, but the logic of, of those formula is the same. Uh, and then this is um, first um, uh, a slide showing uh, the difference uh, between uh, learning poverty and the, the, the primary non-completion rate. But you can see on blue that learning poverty is much, much higher uh, than uh, primary non-completion, right? And, and, and this could be done to different reasons. Um, one of them is that uh, it's a different age group, right? Learning poverty is among 10 years old and primary non-completion would be among older children. Uh, but again, uh, you, you have some children who complete primary school formally, but are not able to uh, properly read and understand the text. And that's why the learning poverty measure uh, we believe is, is useful. Now, the right to education primary index, <coughs> um, this is uh, another visual that you have in the report. And again, the report is, is um, on the uh, website and, and I'll mention the address of the website afterwards. Um, and, and this shows how um, taking into account um, the issue of um, education pluralism makes a difference or not versus uh, simply uh, at the primary level, take into account one minus learning poverty, right? Uh, at the secondary level, we have the same things, but uh, the, the, the anchorage uh, or the anchor is uh, lower secondary completion. And at the tertiary level, we have a measure as well, but the anchor there is the enrollment rate in tertiary, right? Because of what's available um, uh, in terms of those um, outcome measures. Um, here, what you see is essentially uh, that the higher weight, uh, that, that little measure of alpha, the higher weight uh, you place on education pluralism, uh, the lower you do uh, in terms of the right to education primary index. And the same would be true at the secondary and at the tertiary level. I, I do realize uh, this is a little bit technical um, and, and I do apologize for that, uh, but it is an attempt um, to try to um, include uh, specifically uh, the issue of uh, pluralism, education pluralism um, in the measurement of the right to education with otherwise uh, would be based uh, simply, uh, for example, on uh, avoiding uh, learning uh, poverty uh, for primary education or ensuring that the children go and complete uh, secondary and, and, and tertiary um, education. So um, the last uh, part um, of uh, the report uh, touches on something that may be more uh, immediately important for many of you. Um, which is uh, the fact that we are living currently um, in a major uh, crisis due to the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. Uh, this is um, a figure uh, that uh, comes uh, from uh, UNESCO and it shows the number of weeks uh, during uh, which uh, national school uh, networks were closed uh, because of the pandemic. Um, and uh, you can see some differences, uh, of course, uh, depending on geography, but, but in many, many places um, at the national level, uh, schools were closed for 30 to 40 weeks. Um, when you take into account closures uh, within countries, um, I mean, the length of school closures uh, is even uh, longer. Now, <clears throat> you can think, of course, that in some settings, uh, children were still able to learn. Um, and uh, in the United States, many schools have uh, implemented uh, reasonably good uh, distance learning uh, programs. Uh, but of course, uh, in many other countries, uh, and especially in Africa, but also elsewhere, the share um, of the students who actually have access um, to the internet is extremely low. Uh, so I've done computations elsewhere uh, on that. Um, but um, in, in typically in African countries, you would have uh, at most 10% of children uh, who would have access to the internet. Um, and then you can, you can think about the difficulty uh, of ensuring that the children can actually continue to, to learn. Um, what we do have uh, from uh, the World Bank is um, an estimate of uh, the potential impact of the crisis um, on uh, learning poverty. What you have on this graph um, is 
the base level um, of uh, learning uh, poverty um, as uh, defined by the World Bank uh, before um, the crisis, um, and then uh, how uh, learning poverty may have increased. Uh, these are the orange bars um, uh, because um, of the uh, pandemic. Um, and uh, the learning poverty uh, measures is the one that I explained um, before, um, is whether the children are uh, essentially able to read a simple uh, text uh, at age 10, an age-appropriate um, text. Um, you can see that in a pessimistic scenario, which is the one represented here, uh, globally, uh, learning poverty may have increased by 10 percentage points. Now, uh, the World Bank produced also um, optimistic scenarios and then uh, medium scenarios, which are uh, not as uh, bad, uh, but, but between all of the scenarios, there has been a probably a dramatically increase um, in learning uh, poverty. Um, so um, I do want to mention uh, the specific issue for Catholic schools is that, um, especially in countries where um, Catholic schools do not uh, benefit from public uh, funding, um, there uh, has been a large uh, decrease in enrollment because of the crisis. Um, and uh, you can understand why uh, affordability uh, has become uh, weaker. Um, and this is data for the United States uh, that shows that uh, in the school year 2020-2021, so uh, this year essentially, um, enrollment uh, in Catholic schools decreased by 6.4%. Uh, um, uh, that's uh, the largest drop in many, many years, almost 50 years. Um, and uh, that is a drop, uh, especially for elementary students. Um, and uh, that drop will probably carry on in a few years uh, to secondary students. So uh, the schools are affected uh, in a dramatic way. Um, we did some research uh, about uh, what might be the impact of the crisis on enrollment uh, in Catholic schools uh, globally. We got responses uh, from uh, just under 40 countries, if I recall. Um, in some countries uh, where the schools do benefit from public funding, uh, there was not much of an impact. In other countries, uh, there was a dramatic impact and the United States um, is one of those um, cases. Now, how to respond to the COVID-19 crisis? Um, uh, this was already discussed in part uh, in the previous um, Global Catholic Education Report that was published uh, at the very beginning of the crisis last year. Um, uh, this uh, includes uh, multimodal distance learning, um, reopening schools safely. Uh, for the US, you have actually new CDC guidance that came out uh, just on Friday, uh, I think. Uh, real enrollment campaigns, uh, economic incentives in some countries might be very important to try to re-enroll children uh, who uh, dropped out, uh, remedial education, uh, financial reliefs for schools. Um, in the United States, actually, um, uh, Catholic schools benefited like other um, uh, private schools from the CARES Act, uh, but that's not the case in many other countries. And, and finally, importance of data and monitoring, trying to really understand what has happened and, and how uh, in the next few years uh, we can make sure that uh, we don't have lasting impacts uh, from the crisis. And, and this is not going to be easy, but I don't have the time to go uh, in details uh, in this. Um, I do want to mention um, the fact that uh, the report uh, suggests uh, some guidance uh, for the future, uh, including in response to the crisis, but also uh, more broadly. Um, and uh, we do mention um, a new uh, study uh, prepared by the World Bank um, on uh, how to um, improve education outcomes, if you will, uh, realizing the, the, the promise of, 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 of education. Um, the analysis is uh, organized in five uh, buckets, um, uh, how to keep learners engaged, um, how teachers uh, can facilitate learning and, and, and what can be done for teachers, um, uh, whether learning resources, uh, manuals, but many other things are adequate and, and diverse, um, whether uh, the schools are um, safe um, and um, inclusive, um, uh, and then uh, finally, uh, on uh, education uh, systems more broadly, uh, and, and actually I can't see on my screen exactly the wording because my, 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 my video is blocking it, but, but that's the last element. Um, the World Bank proposes uh, in each um, of those uh, five areas, a number of key principles, and you have more details in that report. Uh, I, I strongly believe that um, all of those 
um, suggestions apply uh, to Catholic schools uh, networks in the same way as they apply to public schools. Um, uh, if you take um, one example, uh, for uh, let's take um, uh, the uh, first uh, bucket, uh, which is for the learners, uh, it's very important to increase the provision of early childhood development, uh, to remove demand side barriers to uh, education, and, and of course, cost is, is a demand side barrier. Uh, to put conditions in place for learning uh, to be with joyful rigor and purpose. I won't go into the details. And then to bolster the role of families and communities. Um, I think this is a very, very good document. I'm from the World Bank. Uh, I don't have to say it. I think it's very well done. Um, I also think that it uh, basically avoids completely um, the issue of uh, private provision and especially uh, provision uh, by Catholic schools, but also by all the other providers. Um, I mean, you could say that this was too much to put in that report. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of debate right now. And um, there is no consensus uh, in terms uh, of different actors about how to support um, uh, Catholic education or other types of private education. Um, and uh, what would be very interesting uh, to see uh, in a few months is uh, the report uh, that will be put uh, out uh, by um, UNESCO, uh, the special unit uh, that does the global education monitoring report. Uh, that's a report published every year. And the theme uh, this year is precisely about the role of non-state actors. So that will be uh, very important as a report to uh, set the stage. Um, and uh, although um, as um, people interested in Catholic education, we cannot influence it too much. Uh, I just want to mention that we will prepare uh, a number of background papers for that report um, as well. Um, I have two more slides uh, to conclude. Uh, the first one is that we all have uh, our inspiration. I just want to mention that uh, a key inspiration for me uh, for work on um, poverty more broadly in Catholic schools and, and many other things uh, was Father Joseph Drzezinski. Uh, just you know his name, you can Google him on the web, you will see what, what he was doing. And I do want to mention that we have, apart from publications, uh, we have reports, um, we have uh, knowledge notes, uh, like the one, uh, uh, well, I didn't actually mention those, but you also have interviews uh, with people who have very interesting things to say about uh, Catholic education. I mentioned one here with uh, Sister Marta Seide, um, uh, who is a Salesian from Don Bosco. Uh, we actually also would want to interview people who are critical of Catholic education, why not? Uh, that would be very interesting to learn. And so if you know people we should interview, uh, we would be happy to do that. But we have uh, a series of knowledge notes as well uh, available on the website. So um, <clears throat> to conclude, um, we hope that uh, the uh, Global Catholic Education Report uh, 2021 that I just presented in broad uh, outlines will be useful to you. Um, we are trying to introduce a new measure in that report. Um, you can criticize it, that, that's very welcome. Um, we can still change it. Uh, the report is on the Global Catholic Education website, um, the draft, uh, for three weeks, and we are asking for comments. So if you have any feedback, please, uh, you can write me an email uh, specifically uh, or to the global Catholic education at gmail.com uh, or you can go through the website. Uh, comments uh, will be useful to improve the report or to criticize it. This is all very welcome. We want this to be a discussion. Um, the website itself has a weekly blog so you can read it in three languages. It has a number of links. Uh, we have different publications. Uh, where we are especially uh, interested uh, in your contributions, apart from potentially writing a note for the report, uh, for, for, the, for the website, is on guidance by topics. Right now we have a few good practices guidance. Uh, we would like to have uh, much more. We do organize events and webinars like today. Uh, I do want to mention that OYEC, and, 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 and you heard uh, Philippe Richard uh, at the very beginning of this session mentioning OYEC, uh, has um, a webinar uh, on February 25th um, about uh, the Global Compact for Education, which was um, launched by the Pope recently. Uh, this, the, the website um, and this project on global Catholic education is a volunteer-led project, nobody's paid. Uh, it's all volunteer work and uh, all the help uh, we can get would be welcome. You can get in touch uh, with us uh, through the website. And again, you have here the um, email. So I probably um, forgot to mention many important things, but I think my time is up. 
Um, and so let me uh, stop here and uh, I will be very happy to take questions. Again, the draft report uh, is on the website uh, for three weeks and we welcome comments, positive, negative, uh, to try to improve it before we finalize it. And thank you so much. Um, thank you, Quentin, uh, not only for this presentation, but also for helping to pull together um, both of these webinars in the first place. Um, really uh, fantastic work. So thank you very much. Uh, we will now um, follow with three responses. Um, uh, first response by Hasley Rogers, second a response by Augusta Muktigani, and finally a response by Francois Mavi. Um, Hasley, I invite you to unmute yourself and to turn on your screen. Great, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Quentin. Um, so this is a, this report is an impressive effort. I think a, a useful compendium of knowledge about Catholic education around the world. Um, there's a lot I'd like to discuss in the report, including how to think about this idea of a pluralism, pluralism index, but I'd like to leave some of that for the discussion. And for now, I'll focus my brief remarks on a really important theme of this report is the way it's oriented toward the broader global aspirations for development in education, in particular those that the world is committed to in the sustainable development goals and all considered in the context of this COVID shock. Now, the sustainable development goal four, for those who don't know, is really aimed at realizing the potential of every child. And uh, Philippe in the intro mentioned the right to education and what does that look like in the SDGs? Well, it, it goes beyond sort of a quantity-based conception that was more predominant uh, in, during the Millennium Development Goals, where the focus was getting on children into school. What we now emphasize in, in Sustainable Development Goal 4 is the need to ensure, quote, in, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Now, education clearly involves what, what the report says. The report says, quoting the Congregation for Catholic Education as, quote, uh, education should lead to fraternal humanism and a civilization of love, which I thought was quite an inspiring idea. And that reminds us that education is about developing the whole child and the whole person. Um, but realizing that potential really requires an education that inspires and supports learning including foundational learning. Um, and this is not happening in many countries. I mean, we have, as, as Quentin mentioned, a global learning crisis. And without dramatic concerted action of all parts of society around the world, and that includes faith communities of all types, the situation is going to get much worse before it gets better. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'd like to briefly go through some evidence on that and on what we can do about it because I think this provides the broader context in which Catholic education around the world will be operating in the coming years. So let me um, share a few slides here, which I hope you can see. Um, Quentin mentioned, uh, sorry, the slideshow is not starting. Um, sorry. This worked fine when we tested. Um, I will probably I'll do what I can here. Um, so Quentin mentioned the uh, the the learning poverty, um, and and so the the learning poverty index, which uh, shows here, uh, in in low and middle income countries, um, fifty three percent of children around the world. In, uh, could not read and understand a simple text by age 10. And this is what we called uh, learning poverty. Um, and let me just try the slideshow again. Um, sorry, for whatever reason, that's now not working, but 53% um, of children could not read and understand a simple text by age 10, a simple age appropriate text. And actually, it's even worse than that. Many of these children were actually assessed in, at age 12 or 13. So, so it's much worse. Um, if we look around the world, we, we find that in, uh, Quentin mentioned the focus on Africa. In much of Sub-Saharan Africa, that figure is much higher. We find that uh, in, in parts, you see here the, the 
darker shaded countries, it's 90 to 99% of, of children are in learning poverty. So we had a severe crisis even before COVID. And, and part of the problem was, was in some countries, high levels of inequity, um, where clearly the poorest children, the children who needed it the most, actually had the, the highest levels of learning poverty, which meant they were not getting the leg up they needed from education. Um, even worse, uh, it was not really progressing rapidly enough. We were not getting seeing progress. If you look at the pace of progress uh, over the previous 15 years, we in this report we launched right before the COVID pandemic hit, um, we estimated that although the, the sustainable development goals imply that all children should be able to read by 2030, by the, the year uh, target year of the SDGs, we found that at the current pace, that learning poverty rate would fall only to 43% um, by 2030. Um, so we set a goal for our work to hide, try to help countries at least cut that in half by 2030, get down to 27%, which is still much, much too high. Um, so we already had this learning crisis. Um, now the situation is much worse. With COVID, um, we find that uh, that number is likely to rise to 63%, as Quentin said, over, over the next couple of years um, because of this very high number of school closures with 94% of children out of school at the peak, because uh, distance learning is not working for many children. So you have severe learning losses around the world, including in the United States, um, which Quentin mentioned, but much worse in many other countries. Um, and, and so that's the context where, where we're, we're operating. Um, and, and it's really going to take a concerted effort of, of all of us to try to reverse those learning losses. Um, this is really the, the largest education crisis of the last century. Um, so what we need to now be focusing on is how to turn that around, how to build the foundations of the future of learning, the learning by, as Quentin said, building back better. Um, Quentin went through some of that vision of what that looks like. And, and we want learners to be prepared, motivated, empowered. Teaching has to be socially valued. Um, learning resources, there needs to be enough for teachers and students to work with. We need safe and inclusive school environments and we need systems to be well-managed. And all of that is oriented toward making sure that all children can learn with joy, purpose and rigor. But, but how do we get there and what, what role can faith communities, Catholic schools play in that? Um, I think for that, we can look back at, at what we had in the, the World Development Report, which, which Quentin mentioned. I think uh, that, uh, which we launched a couple of years ago, World Development Report 2018, we argued that there are really three tools to make sure that all children can learn. One is to assess learning to make it a serious goal. We found that lots of countries didn't even know that children were not learning. Um, we've made progress on that, which we now see with this learning poverty indicator. And I think it's great that the report is oriented toward that and really highlights that as a, as a goal, making sure all children have this foundational learning. Um, secondly, acting on evidence to make schools work for all learners. And I saw that one goal of Catholic Education Project is sharing evidence-based good practices. Um, I think that's that's crucial because uh, we know that there's room for improvement in all types of education. As the report says, there's widespread belief in many countries that Catholic education leads to superior outcomes, but that's actually quite hard to show empirically um, for various reasons. And we know there's, there's room for improvement. Um, we recently supported a, a global education evidence advisory panel that came together of leading experts from around the world. Um, they came out with a, a set of recommendations on cost-effective approaches to improve global learning. Um, what are the best ways, most cost-effective ways to move toward these outcomes? And they came up with uh, a series of, of evidence and we look at things that are good investments. These are things like um, reducing travel times to schools, which is something that, that Catholic schools can, can play a role in by being situated where there is no good public education available. Things like structured lesson plans for teachers, really where teachers are not as well trained, um, not as well educated and prepared, 
help them with, with better training and with uh, clear lesson plans, a lot that, that any type of school can learn from. But there are also some bad buys, things like that they identified, like just investing in computer hardware, thinking that that will help solve problems, but without helping teachers learn how to use that and incorporate that in their lesson plans, um, that can often be a very bad buy. So there's lots of this type of evidence that we can all share and, and learn from each other on. And then finally, the final uh, thrust in the WDR was what we called aligning actors to make the whole system work for learning. And there the idea was that we often hear about how we need a whole of government approach to improving learning. So we need to make sure that, for example, health ministries are helping children be well nourished and prepared for schooling. But it really takes a whole of society approach. And we need everybody helping the schools work better from, from politicians, the private sector to international actors, but also civil society organizations, faith-based communities. They play a crucial role um, both in essentially putting pressure on politicians on the political system to make sure that all children have opportunities to learn, especially the most disadvantaged, but also in the case of where we have Catholic education, um, both providing uh, access to schooling where there is none, uh, for example, in remote communities, um, providing new ideas about how to make education work better for all children. Um, so there's a lot that can be done there. And I'm very happy that this report has helped uh, orient that, that discussion toward those goals. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, wonderful. Augusta? Could you unmute yourself and turn on your screen? Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you, Quentin, for the very informative report. Now, my brief remarks um, pegged on the issue of the trends in enrollment in Catholic schools. It is a fact, as Quentin reported, that in Africa, I think in Asia, the enrollment shows, the numbers shows that the enrollment is going up, which is a fact. Uh, and, and that may be due to a number of factors from population to the quality of education offered in that schools in those schools. But I think it would be very interesting at this time to find out as the enrollment goes up in these Catholic schools, what is happening to quality of education offered in those schools? Is, is, are they moving at the same pace? And besides the quality, Quinton mentioned very well that when it comes to education pluralism, parents choose Catholic schools from a perception that there's character formation and values. So with the high enrollment, what is happening to character formation and values? Is there a risk with the high enrollment? Or are we able to maintain the same with increased number of children? Now, Catholic schools and Catholic education is what it is because of teachers. So we have seen the enrollment is going up. I believe we are maintaining the quality, but what are we doing to the teachers in these schools? What happens to the teacher training programs? Uh, in a number of countries, the teachers that work in Catholic schools are trained in the same institutions as those working in other non-Catholic and public schools. So what are we, what is going on, which would be very interesting for me to get to know what is happening with these teachers in Catholic schools so that as the enrollment goes up, then they're able to maintain the ethos, the values, the character and the culture of the schools that is attracting people to these schools. Now, on the issue of running poverty, it is a fact. And I think we, we have seen other findings of researches, even in Kenya, 
which is showing that uh, at age 10, even at age 14, the children are not able to read simple sentences or even do mathematics. And, and, and this may be a pointer at the teacher quality and, and other facts. But of great concern is now with COVID. Um, House mentioned that the figures, he has a 90%. With COVID, that has gone up because, for example, in Kenya, the schools were closed for about nine months. The branded learning was only effective in urban areas for about 30% of the learners. Most of the learners could not access online learning for various reasons. So that means the, the, the levels of learning have gone down completely. Now, it will take a number of months. Schools reopened in January. The full school system opened in, reopened in January. Um, an assessment was done for a certain level, and it showed definitely that the levels have gone down. So that may take a number of months to recover. So what happens to those children? When it comes to the impact of COVID, I think our situation, and in a number of countries in, in Africa and maybe Asia is, is very comp it's complicated, it's complex. Besides the issues of learning, you know, literacy, the issue of, of the mental health of children, children who are out for nine and a half months, exposed to a lot of um, difficult situations, some pegged on child abuse. For them even to recover, to be able to, to study, they require psychosocial support. The teachers may not have the skills to offer that. The leadership of even a Catholic school may not have been prepared to deal with crisis whereby they've got to deal with teachers who need psychosocial support, children who need psychosocial support, parents who need psychosocial support, and at the same time, supervise delivery of curriculum. So, so the, situation have, have, the, the situation is very complex such that um, the learning poverty will be on the increase and we've got to look for measures of addressing that and doing that within a given time so that we do not release children from schools without the basic you know, literacy skills. No, no. In, in, in Kenya, we, we have different categories of private schools, even among Catholic, Catholic private schools. We, we have schools that are in um, disadvantaged areas that offer more than just education to children and their families. They actually support families, not, not children. We have other schools that are in urban areas uh, and the environment is, is quite different. So, so when we look at um, the impact of COVID, the, the, I would like to make three proposals and three suggestions that for the Catholic private schools to address and to mitigate the impact of COVID, we've got to look at the skills of a teacher. We need a teacher with the skills of the old 21st century, teachers who are able to deal with crisis, difficulties that are unforeseen, and, and they are able to adjust to a situation so that they can address to the immediate psychological, mental, emotional, and spiritual needs of children. Number two, we need to explore the possibilities of the public-private partnership. In quite a number of countries, especially in Africa and in East Africa, the church private schools, the Catholic private schools do not receive support from the government. But when you look at this 
COVID times, the schools are struggling, yet they support a very high number of children, more so in the disadvantaged areas. So how, how, how do we talk of um, education pluralism when they are not supported, the school are not supported in whatever way. And the fact is, as we have a saying in this country, that there are no private and public children. Number three is on the strategy, exploring on the strategies of getting parents and guardians to be involved in the learning of their children. Yes, we may have parents whose level of education is not that high, but um, for us to get to a situation where a 10 year old cannot read or write, you know, basics, you know, basic literacy, I think we need to get the parents on board so that the partnership between the family, the school is very strong and, and parents are able to rise with the teachers um, to, to support children in some of the gaps. So even though with COVID the situation is difficult, I think there's hope in Catholic schools um, many parents still opted to have their children in Catholic schools, even with COVID for various reasons. And I think if we are able to get to run programs that are evidence-based, and that is why this report is very important, then we'll be able to address the, the immediate needs of children and you know, the communities and support to ensure that um, we are able to mitigate the learning poverty. Thank you. Back to you, Michael. Thank you. And Francois for our final response. Yes, Michael. So good morning all, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to respond to this report on behalf of uh, the International Federation of Catholic Universities. I would, like, I would like, first of all, to thank Philippe Richard, my colleague, Secretary General of the OIEC, for having taken the initiative a few months ago to launch a very fruitful reflection on possible joint actions between the OIEC and uh, the IFCO, and more generally, other Catholic higher uh, education and Catholic education organizations, joint actions of which this report is the first concrete fruit. And of course, I would like also to thank the author of this report, Contrin, for all the work done and also for the fruitful meetings we have had with him these last months. So I will give you some comments about uh, more specifically the Catholic higher education from a specific point of view from IFCO. First, to comment, uh, this capitalization work make it possible to obtain for the first time, I think, a global view of what Catholic education represents in the world through the diversity of its institution from technical and vocational education to ecclesiastical and Catholic universities. Of course, if Ku is not concerned by all these institutions, as an indication, while the Congregation for Catholic Education estimates at around 1,500 the number of Catholic universities, our survey, which joins uh, that carried out by Boston College a few years ago, only counts a little more than 700 Catholic universities in the world. Now is not the time to go into detail about the different types of Catholic higher institutions, what catches my attention is the figure given by Cantin, just over 6.5 million students in our institutions around the world. This makes uh, this uh, network of our institution globally and the Federation very specifically the leading private higher education group in the world. And the question I would like to raise is the following one. What do we do with this potential force? Do our collaborative practices measure up to what we stand for and what we could do together? And my answer at this very moment is clearly no. My observation today is twofold. On the one hand, I think that many presidents, rectors of Catholic universities, 
are not aware of the evolutions and challenges of what is today a world market for higher education. Consequently, the international dimension of university activities is reduced to student mobility and scientific cooperation without also addressing the challenges of higher education, very well mentioned elsewhere in the report, starting with the inequalities of access to this education. Our collective reflection remains, according to me, insufficient, and our proposals little known, in the, if they exist, in the field of the fight against inequalities and for access to higher education. Likewise, while our field of activity is subject to strong and numerous disruptions, we do not act collectively enough to reflect on the changes that will occur. The risk is then to see our Catholic universities gradually merge into the national education systems with a possible Catholic identity without any other potential influence than that exerted on the campuses and not in the social political order of decision makers. My second comment will deal with pluralism. The reflections proposed in the report are very interesting. Perhaps Kantin will present them in more detail for those who wish. I would like to expand here on the basis of my observations at the head of IFCO. We are currently working on a program called Resilient University, which includes an important team, university facing risk, universities at risk. The existence of private universities, here Catholic, is important to promote pluralism in education systems. We all know the reflections of Catholic social thought, refusing excessive liberalism is desired for a state reduced in its regulatory functions and accusing socialism on the contrary of granting a too important and exclusive place to the state, especially in the education field. And it is always an issue of papal diplomacy to protect and promote the right of local churches and congregations to exercise their right to teach. Catholic universities, beyond their own mission, therefore play a greater role here by allowing the expression of a real pluralism within societies. But what we, are, what we are seeing is also behind the scenes, by which I mean the obstacles put against this expression of pluralism and freedom of education. The absence of government support, already mentioned by Augusta, the rise of religious nationalism, the progress of Islamism, the, the actions carried out against uh, linguistic and religious minorities uh, have a direct impact on the life of many of our universities all around the world. It is therefore also in the light of these real difficulties uh, that the data on pluralism must be interpreted, I think. My third comment will deal with the Catholic identity mentioned in the report. This is, of course, a fundamental theme for us. It is both a certainty about our origins, our values, but also a renewed questioning according to the challenges of the present time. You will allow me several observations. The first is that of an extreme diversity of our intellectual traditions and our Catholic identities. The second equally broad is that universities live on continents affected both differently by secularization processes, but also by national cultures that are more or less tolerant or open to religious actors and therefore to Catholic universities. Third observation, our, Catholics, our universities show an extremely different talent for creation and innovation to renew the relevance of their Catholic identity and to understand the most contemporary issues. Here again, the sharing of experiences should be more frequent, more voluntary. Fourth observation, globally, our Catholic universities not only play a role by their very existence in the expression of educational pluralisms, but they are as such a place of expression for tolerance and pluralism. In, two, in the two international surveys that IFCO has carried out in recent years on the values of young people on our campuses, survey with, surveys which are available to you, it appears very clearly that our students are not predominantly Catholic and that would, we welcome students. Also, coming from other religions, 
These students sometimes even being in the majority on certain campuses. This must be placed in two areas of reflection, that of the participation of the church in the work of pacification of our societies, and that also of a humble but important work of witness to the values of fraternity and tolerance which constitute us. I will end uh, these comments uh, by mentioning perhaps two aspects uh, that are important with this, within IFCU. The first one, the insistence on the social responsibility of our universities, for which we have created a specific referential valid for all education institutions, the Laudato, Laudato Si referential, and which presents, I think, a renewed understanding of our Catholic identity in its presence in the world. Second aspect to say that in all the universities, the quality of the accompaniment of our students under their three main identities, student, future professional, and young citizen, is also a distinctive and constitutive feature of our Catholic identity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would invite all of our panelists at this time to unmute yourselves and turn on your screen as we move into a period of question and answer from the audience. Um, a first question, um, uh, Quentin, to direct to you. Um, uh, how do you define pluralism as it's functioning here? I, I could imagine for many Americans, they might be thinking mostly of pluralism within their schools. So is it simply Catholic versus non-Catholic, religious versus non-religious, spiritual versus non-spiritual? For the purposes of, of this report, um, what sort of definition of education pluralism should our audience members take away? Well, I mean, there are, of course, a lot of constraints in terms of the data uh, to estimate uh, education pluralism. So, I mean, the, the, the basic intuition uh, which comes from uh, the literature on market concentration um, is that if you have um, a firm uh, that has a very large market share um, and other firms uh, do not, the other firms may be squeezed out, right? And that's why you have what's called the Herfindel Hirschman uh, index, which is measured as the sum uh, of the squares of the market shares. Um, you can do a small transformation of that. Uh, to take into account the number of providers that you can actually um, observe uh, with the data that you have. And uh, pluralism here is just a transformation of that. Um, so it's based um, on the market shares of different providers. Um, and one of the limits in the report <clears throat> is actually that globally, uh, for all of the countries in the world, um, I mean, we are able to compute market shares only uh, for public, uh, private non Catholic, and private Catholic schools. I mean, the other uh, types of um, providers, uh, including, for example, the Protestants and so on, do not have the same data that the Catholic Church has, right? Um, now, uh, when you have better data, like, for example, in the United States, uh, you do have better data. Uh, so there's a little box in the report for those interested uh, that computes um, the same measure of pluralism uh, based on 40 different types of uh, schools. Uh, you have 40 different types of schools over time in the US, right? But in most countries, you do not have that. So this is one of the limits um, of, of the analysis. Um, but uh, the idea is that uh, for pluralism, um, if you do have, um, uh, how to say, um, more providers, uh, this is typically good. Uh, now, on a technical note, and I'll finish with that, um, <clears throat> one of the questions is, uh, how much pluralism do you need um, uh, for it to be beneficial uh, for um, an education system, a national education system? So I would argue that pluralism is good, uh, which is a different question as to whether the state should fund uh, the non-state mm. schools, right? That's a slightly different question. In my country of origin, the states funds Catholic, Protestants, all the schools. Uh, in the US, it does not. Right? So, so I'm not getting there, uh, or we're not getting there into this report, but I think some level of pluralism is good because not everybody wants exactly the same thing uh, from all types of schools, right? Um, and um, if um, you have some pluralism, you also, uh, I think uh, it's warranted for the state to impose some conditions on schools, right? It's not that schools can do whatever they want, right? So you have some conditions. So in any case, um, what uh, the report provides in terms of measuring 
um, uh, the, the fulfillment of the right to education um, is to combine data on the, the traditional measures, right? Uh, and learning poverty for primary, because that's a very good measure, which is better than, than completion, for example, to some extent. Uh, and then for secondary, lower secondary, for tertiary, it's enrollment, because we don't have measures of learning. But then you weight that uh, by uh, that measure of education pluralism, um, and, and you're careful in, in, in allowing some flexibility, one which is that you don't want maximum pluralism, you don't want all of the providers to have an equal market share, that doesn't make any sense to me, right? Uh, that's not the point. Uh, you, but and then uh, you also uh, do not place the same weight on pluralism uh, versus the core. The core is still that the children should actually learn something in school, right? And, and as I'll say, mentioned, for example, uh, for um, uh, learning poverty, I mean, the children should be able to read and understand a simple text at age 10, right? That, that remains, right? But then you can um, put some weight, uh, a lower weight, but some weight uh, on the idea of pluralism because of its benefits for society um, as a whole. So I don't know if I answered your question, uh, Michael, uh, but I did. <laughs> Sorry for being a bit long, a bit technical. No, 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 that's great. And so um, continue. So Halsey, uh, there, there are, I think, two related questions um, that both you and Quentin can respond to. But, but to, to start with you, um, a first question about uh, the uh, sort of expansive nature of Catholic work in education. Uh, Susan Raymond writes, Edmonite Missions, a Catholic nonprofit in Selma, Alabama, the poorest city and one of the poorest um, states in the nation with a life expectancy of that of Bangladesh. There, the Catholic, the role of Catholic education is not necessarily inside the walls of a school. Very extensive education programs at K through 12, but not in school, you know, programs on mm -hmm. STEM, internships, employment work, and there's a full range of other ministries um, that they're involved in. How can one, uh, to just sort of frame, boil down the question, how can one better sort of measure the role of Catholic work within education, but outside of schools themselves? That's a first question. And then a second question, um, what about the role of parents who are also a crucial partner for Catholic education and in education in general? Can one account for that role um, within uh, the measurements and assessments um, the, in the work that you and Quentin do at the World Bank? Oh, great, uh, thanks. thanks for those questions. I think, um, it's, it's an important point about not all of Catholic education taking place inside the, the walls of the school. Um, I think that relates to, to uh, a broader question about how, how the Catholic community and other faith-based communities can affect these outcomes. I mean, uh, so I, I noticed there was a question in the q and I don't know if we'll come back to that, but about technical sort of what are the quality assurance, what are the technical solutions? And, and those are very important, but we really need much more than that. We need a society-wide political commitment to making sure that all children can learn regardless of the circumstances into which they're born. And I, that really requires faith communities of all types stepping up and mm -hmm. advocating for these children. Um, and, and there's a clear role for the Catholic uh, church there. And, and we, we see that role in many countries. Um, so I'm not sure it's as much a question of measurement. I mean, certainly you want to have statistics on these out of school programs uh, that you can add to the, the kinds of, of, of statistics that Quentin has shown. But to me, it's really about being visible in that role. Um, I, I think of this in the, in the context of Catholic tradition as kind of the, the, the question from scripture, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? Well, when I was hungry for learning, did you give me the opportunity, regardless of my circumstances, to actually learn? And, and I think the all faith communities can play a kind of a prophetic role on that and, and, and put pressure on, on politicians, on the political system to make sure they deliver, and then also to contribute through their own volunteer efforts like the ones we've heard about there. And, and that brings me to the question of the role of parents. I think the one of the questions pointed out that parents are not explicitly listed in that diagram I showed of societal actors that outer circle. Mm -hmm. And I, that was very eagle-eyed of this uh, participant, well done. Um, they do feature very much in the World Development Report from which that's drawn. Parents are absolutely crucial. They show up there and as part of the community. They also show up when we have this section on learners, like learner preparation, parents are crucial to that. 
and, and obviously never more so than now when schools are closed in many places. And that's why at the World Bank, we have uh, work with partners in what's called a read at home initiative to help equip parents to help uh, with the teaching when they have to. But again, parents have to also play this broader political role of, of pushing politicians to make sure that no children are left behind when it comes to education. Delivered, however, whether delivered through the public school system, whether delivered through Catholic schools or other schools, so it has to be a society-wide effort. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that response. Um, uh, Francoise, a question to be directed towards you. You mentioned the need for a collective solution to mitigate the current challenges faced by Catholic universities. How can this become a reality, given that these universities are at different levels of development with varying challenges? Um, and this is a question from Richard Uma. Okay, just before I come back to your other questions, just yes. very briefly uh, about uh, pluralism, I think that uh, if we want to go further in the future, we will have to take into account perhaps uh, three main aspects. Uh, the first one is, uh, of course, the difference of uh, political regimes, which are very important on, about their impact on uh, pluralism, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, the place of uh, welfare state, the kind of welfare state, is also very important because when you have a very strong welfare state, it means that the state takes into account the uh, the educational field, of course, very often. And the third uh, aspect is probably about uh, the culture and how the culture, the national culture, uh, integrates in the past and uh, in the in the present uh, the religious uh, pluralism. I think that these three aspects are very important to take into account for better understanding how pluralism is effective in, in countries on this topic. Uh, just an, another, uh, another remark about uh, the, the impact of, uh, of schools uh, on their environments. I think that uh, the question is exactly the same uh, with uh, Catholic higher education. It is what we call the social responsibility of uh, our institutions. And uh, now I think that we have, we have many referentials, many frameworks on this topic, which is very important. It's why at IFCO we've tried to, to organize our own framework with uh, um, an uh, inter intelligence artificial uh, engines. But I think that this topic will be more important uh, in the future that than it was, uh, uh, yeah, that it was in, in the past. So uh, the, the quality of the criteria that we include in this kind of framework are very important to understand as it was asked, not only the work that is done on our campuses or in our schools, but also on the, on the local uh, environments. And I don't remember now your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the, the, the question is somewhat related, but um, as, as you, within your work as an institutional leader, work yes. towards collective solutions to help mitigate the challenges faced by Catholic universities, how does one address the fact that universities, even within the same nation, but also this is a global report looking broadly, um, have uh, different levels of development and varying and different challenges. What does it mean to work towards a collective solution when there's such a um, inequity between institutions? Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure having any response to, to, to that. Uh, in fact, I, I think that it is uh, the, uh, the the main interest uh, of working in, at IFCU uh, to understand that great diversity of uh, of our universities all around the world. Uh, one thing, once uh, thing that I think that what we we must do uh, is to share to share our practices, uh, to share our reflections on the evolutions which are quite different from a country to to another. Of course, to share our data. Uh, I think that perhaps we are we are diverse, but perhaps that the the collaboration, the cooperation among us, is not uh, uh, enough worked. And uh, if I have a call <laughs> today, it could be that uh, on the, the website uh, that uh, Cantina has uh, created and uh, on each website, we can uh, reinforce this, uh, this uh, aspect. Perhaps that's uh, the, the last point is that, um, as I mentioned, I'm very impressed by the, the so many disruptions that uh, we're facing now. 
And it is also one point that is very important for, for me. How do we think about these evolutions? In one slide, Kantin um, showed uh, the, 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 the work bank blueprint and the topic of governance of schools was mentioned. I'm sure that it is exactly the same for uh, higher institutions. How do we think about the evolution of the governance of our institution? So there are some very precise uh, points uh, that, uh, according to me, that are very important. And uh, we, I think that uh, we should adopt perhaps a more uh, prospective approach to these uh, problems. Great. Um, and then uh, I will move to just a final question and then open to see if there's any additional comment from our panelists. Um, but Augusta, a question I'll direct to you um, from Jane Wambui Kinyanjui. Um, how, to, how does one assure Catholic education in, and inclusive, inclusivity while in our, in, within institutions um, while welcoming all students who choose to come, but, that, but trying to also encourage those students to respect their religious identity? So, so a question on the ground. What does it mean to foster inclusivity within institutions, welcoming all students, but also help fostering within those students the need to respect their and others' religious identities? Since you, I know, are a teacher and have experience on the ground, I'd love to get your feedback on this. And briefly, yeah. since we're running at uh, the hour. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. I, I think the issue of inclusivity is very keen Catholic education. And, and, and it's based on the values, because the values that are focused on are, are values that, um, that are universal, they are human values. So when you talk of respect, when you talk of honesty, and, and when that, when that is, in, is, um, is inculcated in learners, then they are able to embrace all, regardless of the background ones come from. And this is where I would like to go back to the point I was emphasizing on, on the preparation of teachers, because the success of inclusivity is based on, on the capacity of teachers to help children realize that, yes, we are all different, but we have a lot of commonalities and I need to accept other persons the way they are. So, so, so it's, um, it is very possible to have inclusivity and diversity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, now we are reaching the end of the hour. I, I want to let you all know though that um, Quentin has already offered to uh, incorporate your questions, your thoughts, not only within the global report, um, but also in the further directions um, that his project continues. I've already posted his email within the chat and the website um, where you can revisit. Um, I wanna see if there's any just final comments from the panel um, before I close um, and feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Uh, Quentin? Yeah, maybe, maybe one comment from me. Um, so uh, the Global Catholic Education website uh, is a very new effort. Uh, it went up uh, at the end uh, of November for Thanksgiving. Um, we can really take the website and the work uh, that is uh, shown on that website in many different directions. So we need, uh, if you're interested, your comments, your contributions. Um, it is uh, co-sponsored by uh, OYEK, uh, by IFQ, and by OMAEK, and by um, UMEK. Uh, so it is K-12 university uh, alumni and teachers. Uh, but again, um, the, the idea is to make this useful to you. So if you do have um, any question, any comments, whether it is on this uh, specific draft report uh, that we will finalize within the next uh, few weeks or whether it is on other things you believe uh, we should do, please uh, do reach out um, through the website. You can contact us. Thank you so much. Well, uh, again, then I just want to express a word of gratitude to all of our panelists here um, for helping us attend to this really important and crucial issue that's not only a local issue wherever we're at, but also a global one um, that uh, certainly us within the Catholic community have a care for all of those around the, the world, as Pope Francis um, called us recently in his most recent papal encyclical. Um, and thank you for joining us. Um, as uh, participants of today. You can register for the next installment of our series in Economics and Catholic Social Thought 
at our website. Um, I'm grateful to the organizers and co-sponsors who've helped ensure today's success, the Catholic Research Economist Discussion Organization, Global Catholic Education, Global Researchers Advancing Catholic Education, American Media, the Roche Center for Catholic Education, International Federation of Catholic Universities, the National Catholic Education Association, and the International Office of Catholic Education. Um, many distinguished organizations that have had many distinguished panelists even here um, who are leaders of those today. Um, and finally, I invite you to support us, help get word out about more events, or become a financial supporter of our work to put on more programs like these for free um, at www.lumenchristie.org slash donate. Thank you all again and have a wonderful week. Thank you.